Well, it's good to be here and to worship with you this morning. And if you're just joining us, we are walking through Mark. We're in Mark chapter 6 today. And if we have that first slide, I'm going to tell you about the sermon title out here at the front. It will be our theme for our reflection on God's Word. And maybe you've heard of this story before. If you've ever been down to downtown, there's a monument for these guys who adopted this slogan, which you can see here is, Go for Broke. And actually, Morgan just told me that she did a, a paper on these guys. Uh, this is three guys from the 442nd Regiment in World War II, and they are Japanese American soldiers. And the way that I learned about them was through this concept of go for broke, because this concept is something that has become a common vernacular in the lexicon of many different uh, metaphors, and one of them is through this concept of boxing. And when, uh, if you're watching a boxing match and you see one guy is getting beat up really bad, but he's kind of making it through the rounds, at some point he'll go to his to the corner and his coach will tell him to go for broke, meaning you better come out swinging and try and knock the other guy out because if you don't, then you're going to lose this boxing match, okay? And this concept actually comes from poker and these Japanese American guys who are mainly from Hawaii and you know from your American history class that Hawaii was attacked, right? On, at Pearl Harbor, which is the main reason why we went into World War II. And these Japanese Americans really found themselves with, a back, with their backs against the wall because they were put in a position where the enemy that attacked them was, they, they looked like them and they you know, had a similar culture to them. And so unfortunately they were put into internment camps. So there was two wars going on for these Japanese American soldiers. Uh, one at home and one abroad. And what's amazing is in that kind of a situation where their back was against the wall, as far as it could be, they had nothing to give except their faithful duty and service to our country. Uh, they decided what they were going to do was go for broke. And what's amazing is this 442nd, if we have the next slide, they became the most decorated unit in American history. And they earned more than 18,000 awards, including 9,500 Purple Hearts, 5,200 Bronze Star Medals, 588 Silver Stars, 52 Distinguished Service Crosses, seven Distinguished Unit Citations, and one Congressional Medal of Honor. And this is what President Eisenhower said to them at a speech that's the next slide, says, oh, excuse me, Truman, said that to these soldiers in his speech to the 442nd, you fought no, not only the enemy, you fought prejudice, and you won. Go for broke. What an incredible idea that when your back's against the wall that you would go all the way forward when the obstacles are against you, that you would not turn from them or hide or cower away, but that you would go straight forward and towards the most difficult fight possible. What an incredible uh, group of guys these were. What a testament to uh, the power of America and what they taught us is a valuable lesson. So with that in mind, we also just read a scripture that uh, Jesus is speaking to his disciples uh, and in a similar fashion, inviting them to do something that would be, seem so counterintuitive for us, that he turns to his disciples on their first mission. They're getting ready to go out on their own for the very first time, and Jesus is commissioning them, and he's telling them that they need to take less than they already have. Go for the most stealth version of yourself. What, what an interesting thing that Janus just read us from the scriptures about what the disciples should do. A massive challenge. Jesus doesn't say, you know, well, 
take, you know, all your literature, take, take a, get the camp set ready, get all your food going. He says, no, no, no. You're going to be totally reliant on God and on other people, the hospitality of other people for your journey, this little stealth mission you're going to go on to preach the gospel for the first time. And in that, you're going to learn a ton of lessons about what it means to be dependent on Jesus. He's saying, go for broke. Go all the way. See what it's like to take me up on this great big calling, this great big challenge. I think one of the things we struggle with in our culture, in a culture where we get to experience a lot of comfort, is that we don't always get invited into the challenge. We don't get invited into the great journey. We don't get called out and told, you have a big mission to accomplish. Go and do this great thing that God is calling you to do. We don't have that sense of adventure and destiny. And yet we see these words living on our pages of our Bibles that are saying, go out, be the great hero. Go out, do the great bold act. And we're going to talk through this whole chapter here because it's going to teach us about how to take on this adventure. Because if you want to open in your Bibles, you can see just in the, in the uh, titles of the various stories in Mark chapter 6 that there is a whole explanation for the ways in which we become these kind of bold disciples. So the first story that you'll see after the one we just read, and I'm going to summarize them because we don't have time to read all of them today, is about John the Baptist. And this is an intense story about how John the Baptist becomes a martyr for the church. And we all know that this is a, a, this is a great example of, wow, like if you go all out for the sake of the kingdom, what could possibly happen to you? And it, it's been said that, you know, the reign of a tyrant ends on the day that he dies, but the reign of a martyr begins on the day that he dies. And I think there's something true there for John the Baptist, that this is an example of, so, so Mark, the genius editor, is putting these stories one after the other to teach us something. And if you're intimidated by the fact that John the Baptist went all out and all, it cost him his life, well then you're in the camp of the disciples, where we're gonna continue on the story because uh, here we find the disciples in the midst of this, this story unfolding and a couple miracles that are going to teach them more and more about what it means to follow after Jesus because they didn't quite get it yet. We meet John the Baptist when he has fully understood how his integrity matters so much that we talked about his message matters so much that he's willing to die for that message. And we're going to find that the disciples don't quite yet understand the message and what, what they should do with it. Uh, and so Jesus is going to challenge them and continue to challenge them through uh, Mark chapter 6 and beyond as to really understanding the mission that they're on with God. Okay, so with all that said, point number one in the sermon today, life is suffering. Okay, I know. You came to church for that one this morning, right? Feels really good to hear that life is suffering. I know, I know that it doesn't feel, you know, like a nice friendly thing to clap for this morning, but it is the truth. It is the truth that if you face it, you will begin to understand life and the complexities of life in a way that give you an aim, in a way that uh, allow you to adopt mission and purpose in life. And it's not just suffering for suffering's sake alone, but turn with me to Romans chapter 5, and we'll read this together really quickly. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 says this. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, and death 
through sin. And in this way, death came to all people because all have sinned. So the reality is, is we've all come into this room knowing that there's tragedies that we've experienced or that we've yet to experience in life. And that everybody in this room has been touched by sin. And that sin causes suffering. In fact, that sin ultimately leads to death. And every single person has to endure life as suffering. And, you know, some really smart guys called the existentialists came up with this idea much later than, our, than when the scriptures were written down. But I want to introduce you to one guy. He, he looks very thoughtful. His name is Soren Kierkegaard, and he's my favorite existentialist. But th- the idea here of Soren, Kier- Soren Kierkegaard was a Christian, and uh, he was a guy who had a real dark existential feeling about life, but he also, like every good Sunday school kid, knew that the answer to the existential crisis of life was Jesus, right? Every right answer is Jesus from the Sunday school expression of things. But the existentialist talked about something that's in Job, which is that it's not just like your own personal mistakes and missing the mark and sin that causes suffering in the world, but there's a fundamental thing that broke in the world at the fall that has all of this suffering that if you go out into the world, you will experience and come to know well. And you all resonate with this just because you've lived life and you've experienced that suffering. And you know what it's like to feel lost and alone. And you know what it's like to feel like you want to be able to live up to what God's calling you or to seek your aims, to seek your goals, and yet you fall short. And in fact, the word that's used in that Romans text for sin is, can, can be translated as missing the mark. It's like a hero trying to accomplish his task but has a fatal flaw that contributes to his inability to achieve his heroic destiny. That's the Greek word that is influencing this idea of sin. So it assumes that there's an aim and that you're an archer and you're trying to hit a target and you're missing the mark, okay? And the existential philosopher Soren Kierkegaard said it this way, anyone who really knows mankind might say that there is not one single living human being who does not despair a little bit who does not secretly harbor an unrest, an inner strife, a disharmony, an anxiety about an unknown something or something he dare not even try to know, an anxiety about some possibility in existence or an anxiety about himself. Okay, good news this morning. How is that good news that there is this anxiety deep within each person? Well, it gives us a challenge. It presents us with the great dilemma of every human being. So if every person experiences suffering, and then we meet this Jesus who turns again, let's read the line, I think we have the next slide up there, of the scripture that we have. Take nothing for the journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in your belts. And the slide before that said, okay, so if life is suffering, then find a meaning that justifies that suffering. Aim for the highest goal. Set your arrow on the target that would alleviate suffering. If you want to find your purpose in life, there are so many young people that all the time are like, what should I do with my life? Who should I become? The answer to that is find a meaning that justifies the suffering. Go out and alleviate some suffering. Go out. It's all around you all the time. It's at every desk job, at every normal, everyday activity, in every household, and every person next to you, there is a person who has been touched by suffering. And so if you want to find meaning and purpose in life, then go out and try and alleviate a little bit of it. 
and see if you don't become totally alive. See if your head doesn't hit the pillow that night with a sense of contentment, a sense of being used. Find a meaning that justifies the suffering. Okay, and so how does Jesus teach us how to do that? Well, he's going to teach us through two miracles that are also found in Mark chapter 6. And the first one, uh, oh, and okay, one more idea behind this. I kind of like this idea, is uh, that humans are like pack animals. Not the ones that hunt in packs, but the ones that carry heavy loads. So I have a picture of that. Don't you resonate with this buffalo in the Himalayas? A pack animal, plural noun, an animal used to carry heavy loads. Translation, Jesus said, okay, if you don't think life is suffering, then you just walked into a church where there is a massive cross in the background of everything that I'm saying because Jesus took on suffering, because life is suffering. And then not only that, what did Jesus teach his disciples about suffering? He said, therefore, take up your cross and follow me. Okay, so this is another way of saying the same thing. Become a pack animal. Because the journey is hard, but if you're carrying a heavy load, you'll find purpose and meaning in life. Okay, so meditate on the buffalo in the Himalayas. And so the next two miracles, uh, I think we have some artistic, oh, there's the disciples. If you're intimidated by this calling, so were they. And then here they are, next scene after John the Baptist in the scripture is this picture of Jesus feeding the 5,000. I don't know if you can see that very well, but I love the light and vibrancy of this scene that we see here. And Jesus is traveling, and all of a sudden, a crowd is amassing, because if you've been tracking on this journey, you're seeing over and over again that Jesus is doing amazing things. He's healing people. He's casting out demons, and his name is becoming great, and people want to come to see and seek out the healing of this new teacher that's on the scene, that's announcing the kingdom of God and then bringing it to fruition, a taste of heaven in a way that the earth has never seen before. So great crowds are gathering, and this is the scene of the feeding of the 5,000. And in Mark's gospel, the way that this unfolds is that uh, Jesus sees the crowd, and he sees that they're like sheep without a shepherd, and he has compassion on them. And so Even though he's busy, he decides he's going to teach them. And as he begins to teach them, they get hungry. And there's a lot of them. And what's amazing is Jesus is preparing to do this miracle, but he's also wanting to teach the disciples that they can participate in the miraculous things that God is doing. And so he tells them You go, and you guys can read this later, you go give these people something to eat. Because God wants to use us. For whatever reason, his plan to feed hungry people and care for the world is us. He wants to empower us. The disciples are his vessel to do his miracle on this day, on this beautiful, vibrant day. There's something about this picture that if you've ever been around a really amazing kingdom moment, it feels like this life in full technicolor and full display, and Jesus at the center of it doing the miracle, and the disciples around it participating in this incredible scene. And so he goes out and gives them, on that day, they do a miracle. They, they feed 5,000 people. What an incredible thing, you would think right? And you'd be like, man, of course the disciples clicked into this. They were like, look what Jesus did. What an incredible miracle that just happened. We fed 5,000 people with two loaves and a little bit of fish. But the next miracle in the gospel story is going to tell us that the disciples on this vibrant, beautiful day did not understand what was happening. Okay, so the next artistic representation of the gospel is a famous story, one that's captured the imagination of the church and outside of the church. Jesus walking on water. 
This is the same day. And on this very same day that Jesus feeds the 5,000, he goes away on a hillside to pray. And his disciples go out. And they go out on the sea, and they're rowing, and there's wind. And if you're a sailor, you know that rain is fine, but when wind comes, things get dicey. Because wind causes waves, and the waves started to get big, and the disciples started to get terrified in their boat. And then all of a sudden, here comes Jesus walking on the water. And I love this this depiction of this light, this little light of mine. This light walking out on this dark scene. And these disciples who are totally terrified. And so they go, it says that they saw what they thought was an apparition. They thought it was a ghost. And then they call out to it. And they say, come. And, and Jesus says, do not be afraid, for I am. It is I out here on the water. And as we go in the story, it says that the disciples did not yet understand the feeding of the 5,000. They did not yet understand And so they needed another miracle to teach them about the last one. You need two miracles to teach you. (laughs) We need many amazing, extraordinary things to teach us lessons in life. But the light didn't do what the darkness could. That deep in the failure of the disciples here, as Jesus was coming to walk on water, they learned that in their dark moment, that if they're going to go for broke, they're going to experience failure. They're going to experience suffering. But they're also going to have Jesus in their boat with them. That in the light moment and in the dark moment, There is communion with God. Because God is the bread of heaven. Jesus is the living word, the word that became flesh and dwelt among us. He is manna from heaven in the desert. The bread of life. And he is also light in the darkness. In the deep, dark pits of our suffering, he is there in the boat. And this story doesn't say like other stories that Jesus got up and he calmed the storm. In this story, Jesus is simply in the boat with them as the waves rock. So there's a TV show that sometimes I watch, and you could watch this clip on YouTube if you want to. Um, It's called The Great... the greatest catch, okay? And it's on the Discovery Channel, and it's about crab fishermen in Alaska who go out, and they risk their lives just to get these Alaskan king crab that are super rare and super expensive, and in fact, there's a a bunch of guys on a bunch of different ships, and they fight each other all the time to get this crab. And, you know, it's, it's on Discovery Channel. It's one of the, you know, most dangerous jobs you could possibly do. And there's these funny banter they have between each other, and they, they try and mess with each other and lead each other down bad paths as to where the fish may be. And they're competitive just like any other business would be competitive. But there's this one episode where two boats come across one another, and there's a guy out. There, there's huge waves happening, and so what they have to do is they take all their, uh, their nets and their, all these things they use to fish out the king crab, and they have to put them, all these cages, on, in the center of the boat, and just so they can endure all the waves that are happening. And you see the camera pans to the other ship, and on the other ship, there's a guy, and he's like on the side of the boat, and he's trying to get these, 
cages into the middle of the boat, and he's just being tossed to and fro from the waves, and you start to get a little anxious as you see this guy doing this really crazy thing. And then all of a sudden, a huge wave comes and takes this one man into the water. And these are freezing cold waters, and it takes like a minute or so for hyperthermia to set in, and people lose their lives. And so this other boat sees what's happening because the film camera is like capturing it, so they know what's going on. And so they, they drive the boat as fast as they possibly can over to where they think this guy is because they have the best possible uh, you know, vantage point as to rescue him. And so a minute goes by and they finally grab this guy. They throw him out. They, they, give, they, they throw him the life rafter and they bring him in the boat and he's freezing and terrified and he says, I would have died. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And they bring him into the boat, and he's not out of the clear yet because he's still cold. And so they, they get all his clothes off, and they put towels on him, and they warm him up. And after a few minutes go by, they realize he's going to be okay. And then the captain of the boat and this guy have this exchange. And they, they talk about how he should have died, but he didn't. And they have this big hug. And everybody on the boat, these big tough fishermen, all begin to start crying. They all f feel like what they did that day was massively important. That they went out and they didn't do their normal making money for themselves. They went out, they saved one guy's life. And I highly recommend watching this. But there's something about everybody in this room that knows that that kind of sacrifice in the midst of suffering is what lights us up, is what brings us to full communion with God. And I bet they went to sleep that night at full peace about their jobs. So my encouragement for you is find some suffering. Where is their suffering in the world? And then rely on God to help you alleviate that suffering. And if you have bad aim, bring the target closer do little small steps of love and care and compassion for the people around you. And when you can hit that target, then you can move the target back and you can shoot for bigger things and move the target back and shoot for bigger things. But if you take these little small steps, I guarantee you, you will experience what is depicted here. Communion with God. Even in the tough moments, you will feel connected. You will feel alive. You will feel like you have purpose and meaning in life. And you will be on mission for God, the highest aim. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for today. And God, we pray that you would send us out in acts of love and compassion, totally dependent on you, totally reliant on your word as a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, God. And when we find ourselves in the big waves, God, we pray that we would recognize that you are still the great I am, and we may be still and know that you are God. And I pray for anybody who's in that dark moment now, that you would reveal to them the truth that you are there, that you are guiding them, that you are leading them through all the storms of life, God. And more than that, that we might have deepest communion with you in our darkest, most difficult times. Help us to be the kind of people that could be relied upon in those darkest, most difficult moments. In your name we pray. Amen.